Glad that you're here. Hey, and I'm glad that you made it like fairly on time. Some of you are a little bit late, but most of you are on, on time. Thank you for being here. I heard about a little boy that he was, uh, he was typically on time for his little Sunday morning class, and he showed up pretty late to his class. And so the Sunday school teacher asked the question, hey, hey little Johnny, is everything okay? And he said, yes, ma'am, everything's okay. Um, and she said, well, why are you late today? She said, and his response was, well, um, I was going fishing, but daddy told me that I, ha- I needed to come to church instead. And so the teacher asked him, said, little Johnny, did your dad explain to you why it's more important to be you know, involved with your church on Sunday morning than out there fishing? And he looked at her and said, yes, ma'am, he did. And, and the teacher said, well, little Johnny, what did your dad have to say about that? And he looked towards her and said, well, my daddy said that, that he didn't have enough bait for both of us. So, <laughs> so I, I hope that you showed up on time because you're disciplined and you wanted to be here or you ran out of bait. Either way, it works for me. Either way, it works for me. But I'm glad that you're here today. And I'm really privileged to walk you through 1 Corinthians as we dive back in. I'm grateful for Tim Huey stepping up and teaching last week. He did a great job last week, didn't he? And grateful for him. Yeah, give it up for Tim. He's not in here, but yeah, we'll say thank you, Lord. I love our deacons and the way that they serve, and he was able to teach and and grateful for him. Also, for the last couple of weeks before I left, we were talking about abortion in America, and I am super grateful, again, that our Supreme Court made the right decision to actually go with what our Constitution says instead of making something up that wasn't there in the first place in 1973. I'm grateful for that. And again, it's our task to to speak truth and love, to care for women who are in tough situations, and also to protect the life of innocent, unborn human beings. So let's be, let's be about that. I am going to jump back into 1 Corinthians 9, and we're going to talk about running for the prize. And right before we do, I just want to ask you a question. Anybody ever in here ever ever really stretched yourself took time and effort and sweat to compete in something. Anybody ever done that? Yeah. I wonder how many people, I won't have you raise your hands, but there are other things. It might be beyond physical competition. I wonder how many have, have really, you know, you've been really strict on a budget so that you could get finances back in line. You've done something that's really, um, you, you've taken time and effort, and, and you would say, you know what, on the front end, this is really tough, but if I do what's right on the front end, it's going to pay off in, in the end of this. Anybody been there before, right? So maybe it's something physical, something you compete in. Maybe it's something financial. Uh, Maybe it's some sort of task that you were you were trying to accomplish. But here's here's what I want to talk with you about today. Our financial accomplishments, our physical uh, accolades and trophies, one day aren't going to mean that much. When you're getting ready to breathe your last, I don't think that I'm going to be majorly concerned in my own life about um, what financial place I came to in my life. You know. I don't think I'm going to be, I guarantee you this, I'm not going to be talking about all my physical accomplishments. And as we get older, here's what I've learned. The older we get, the better we were. If you notice, that, you know, you're like telling people stories about when you used to compete, and they don't care. They don't, they don't care. So these kind of things that, that we, we push for and we've, we've, we put sweat into, what's going to matter when you breathe your last? What's going to matter? And I would submit us the things that you do for the Lord Jesus and how you honor him. And so we're going to talk about running for the prize today. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for the privilege of allowing me to attempt to teach the scripture today. And I pray and trust that you're going to help me to do that. And then you're going to do what I can't do. You're going to deal with people at a heart level, including dealing with me. And uh, I pray that you would challenge and encourage and correct where needed in each life here. You know what each person needs. And I pray that you would do what I can't do. We thank you for this scripture from 2,000 years ago, 6,000 miles removed from us from a totally different language that's not even spoken today, and amazing that we have it in our language today that we can read. So, Lord, by the power of your Spirit, I pray that you would help us to remove any other thoughts that, that could get in the way, and uh, we, would, we want to hear from you. So help us in that as we open the scripture. Amen. Again, we're in 1 Corinthians and we are going to be in chapter 9. But right before we get there, let me remind you of where we were in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. In 1 Corinthians chapter 8, I'm going to read a passage for you in just a second, but I want to remind you of the context. Here's the context. Paul has talked about the freedom that he has in Jesus. He talks about the freedom that all Christians have in Jesus. And yet, if you remember, one of the things he's dealing with, he's having to deal with with people who are more mature in their faith, seemingly, but they're, they're putting a whole lot of focus on their own freedom rather than trying to make sure that 
they're not doing anything to be a stumbling block for the faith of younger believers. So in Corinth, for example, there were temples, and in the temples they would sacrifice animals, and many of the sacrifices that, were, that happened in the temples were actually taken to the marketplace. So when you typically bought meat in the marketplace in Corinth, it had already been sacrificed to a false god. Paul knew, and Paul told the people, he said, hey, listen, these are false gods. There are no other real gods, and so you can eat this meat if you're mature in Christ because you're not eating it to a god because there is no other god but the one true god. And that was his point. However, what he recognized, and here's what he writes, and now it'll make sense in context, and you'll see why we picked up back here. In 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 12, he says this, now when you sin like this, and what he was doing, he was pointing to these mature believers, supposedly, get this, that were more concerned about practicing their own fr- freedoms than trying to help the faith of young ones who, for example, saw that this meat was out of a temple, and they thought if you eat meat out of the temple, you're sinning against Jesus, and there wasn't time to, to walk them through this and talk them through this, and these people were evidently like, I don't care, I have freedom, I'm going to eat anyway, and it caused young ones to stumble. And so he says, when you sin like this against brothers and sisters, and you wound their weak conscience, you are sinning against Christ. You're sinning against Jesus, he says. Then he says, therefore, if food causes my brother or sister to fall, I will never again eat meat so that I won't cause my brother or sister to fall. Now, Paul didn't stop eating meat, but his point was, if if me eating meat causes problems with a young believer in Corinth, and they see this as sinful, then I'm going to, I can walk them through that and be patient with them. But I love, get this, I love my brother or sister more than I love being right. I love my brother and sister more than I do love eating this meat, right? And he says, I want to walk them through this and talk them through this because, because I love their, I I love their young faith that needs to grow more than I love my own freedom to eat what I want to eat. That's the context. So first Corinthians chapter nine, here we go. Here's what he says. Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are you not my work in the Lord? If I'm not an apostle to others, at least I am to you because you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. So here's the deal. You've got apostles who were people who were called out specifically by Jesus to take the message of Jesus to the world, to make disciples of the world. And the apostles, if anybody has freedom in Christ, it would probably be who? The apostles, like they're the, they're the top of the food chain. And what I mean by that is they're the, with the exception of Paul, the rest of the apostles knew Jesus personally, had walked around with him, been discipled by him. If they say Jesus says we have freedom, then guess what? We have freedom. That's his point. Now, Paul was an apostle. And if you know, and I place some references in there for you, Paul tells this story. He calls himself an apostle who was untimely born. And what he means by that is, is I was an apostle who didn't actually get to meet Jesus, didn't get to follow Jesus. But you remember that his claim is he went from persecuting followers of Jesus to Jesus shows up in a vision and says to Paul, he calls him to be his apostle to the Gentiles. And so we have a specific call from Jesus and his life radically changed. By the way, one of the most significant life changes in all of history, what in the world happened to Saul of Tarsus, also known as Paul? What happened to that guy? He went from killing Christians to being killed as a Christian and and being hunted down as a Christian. Something happened to that guy. What didn't happen is he didn't make more money. He didn't get more prestigious. He actually laid that stuff down. He said, I consider that to be rubbish like dung, like dog poo compared to knowing Christ is what he says. Incredible. And so Paul says, I'm an apostle. And then he says this to him. He says, "And, and you are the seal of my apostleship. You're the seal of my apostleship. We don't use seals very often today, except that I was talking with Miss Linda, and Miss Linda said that, that Fain, with his work, that he has to give a, a, a seal to communicate the authenticity of his work when he goes out to survey a piece of land. There will be wax in the wax. There will be a stamp put on the wax. You've seen this kind of thing, or a signet ring back in their day that would be put on that would authenticate who this comes from. And here's what Paul says. You want to know my authentication for being an apostle of Jesus? It's your lives. If you look at the change in your lives, Corinthians, he says, that is the evidence, the authoritative evidence that I'm an apostle of Jesus because the message of Jesus has reached you and is growing you and changing you. And that's what Paul says. And so in spite of being an apostle, though, what, what Paul, uh, uh, Paul is now dealing with, he's asking question: am I not free? We're going to see the things that he's free to do, and yet he willingly will even limit his own freedom because of the faith of others. Look at what it says here in verse 3. 
My defense to those who examine me is this. There's those who are saying, Paul's not an apostle. He's saying, yes, I am. Don't we have the right to eat and drink? We've already discussed that briefly. And don't we have the right to be accompanied by a believing wife like the other apostles, the Lord's brothers in Cephas? Doesn't Paul have the right to eat whatever meat because all of it's clean in the Lord? Sure. Can Paul drink whatever he wants to because it's clean in the Lord? Sure. But what he's saying is, I'm not, I'm not going to do that for the faith of others at times as we've talked about. But then he makes this statement. He says, and aren't we allowed, and we're going to see he's talking about himself and Barnabas, aren't we allowed to bring along a, a, a spouse, a believing spouse? And look who he names can bring along the believing spouses. He says, the Lord's who? Brothers. By the way, if, if you have a Catholic background and you're taught that Jesus didn't have physical brothers, that, that is not biblically accurate. These are not his cousins. This is not the word used for cousins. It's referring to his brothers. How do we know this? Because they are two who are recognized by the early church as brothers of Jesus. One of them, his name, is we would actually call it Jacob or Jacob, or we say James because that's how it's translated for us, or also Judas or Judah or Judas. Jesus had a brother named Judas. Yep, it used to be a happening name until Judas did him his thing. Do you know anybody named Judas? No, you don't. No, you don't. <laughs> So why not? Because, because that's the person who betrayed Jesus. But Jesus had two brothers. So watch this. This is key. And, and Cephas, who is that? I'm going to show you. The Lord's brothers are James and Jude. They both wrote small writings in the New Testament, if you've ever read those before. Cephas is the name that Paul calls Peter. If you've been taught that Peter is the first pope, this is simply not true. Number one, the, the first Roman popacy came in in the 6th century. That's 600 years after the time of Jesus, roughly. Let's go 500 just to be safe. 500 to 600 years after the time of Jesus. The Roman papacy wasn't recognized. You might say, well, Jackie, in the 300s, they mentioned the Catholic Church. Yes, that's not the Roman Catholic Church. The word for Catholic is a Greek word that means universal. There are people in Kenya today that are followers of Jesus, just like you and I are followers of Jesus. And together, we were part of the universal church, not the Roman Catholic Church, but the Catholic Church, the universal church. Does that make sense? Here's the other thing. If popes can't be, what, married, then how is it that Peter, supposedly known as the first pope by many Catholics, was what? Married. He was married. Do you remember Mark 2, by the way? Mark 2, you can go read it for yourself. Jesus goes to to Peter's house, and Peter's mother-in-law is sick. So Jesus heals Peter's mother-in-law, and then she gets up after the fever's gone, and she begins to serve them. Remember that? Here's what I know to be true across the ages. Nobody goes shopping for a mother-in-law. Nobody. (laughs) They go shopping, they go looking for a wife, and you get the mother-in-law as part of the package deal, right? Peter was what? Married. And here's what Paul's saying. He's saying, hey, Jesus' brothers, they're able to come and do ministry, and their wives are with them. They have lots of freedom, including bring their wives. Peter comes, and he ends up bringing his wife, and he has the freedom to do that. And then Paul says, what about me and Barnabas? Now, a lot of people, we don't know for sure, but scholars think that that Paul had either been married and his wife had died, or Paul had been married and his wife had left him because of his desire to follow Jesus and radical change in his life. We don't know what the case is. Paul at one point was married. We know he's not married at this point. Now, here's what he's getting at. Look what he's saying, verse 6. Or do only Barnabas and I have no right to refrain from working? Now he goes to this other part, and he says, look, we can eat what we want, we can drink what we want, we could bring our wives if we wanted to. And then he says, and these other guys, they get to refrain from working. Now this doesn't mean they don't work hard. What he's getting at is they don't have a job outside of being apostles. They don't have a job outside of praying and outside of teaching and outside of making disciples of Jesus and going to other places to make disciples of Jesus. They don't have other jobs. That's what Paul says. He says, don't we have that right? What would the answer be? Yeah, because Paul, you're an apostle. Look what he goes on to say. This is a great illustration. He says, who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Does a soldier serve at his own expense? No, they're taken care of for the work that they do. And then he says this, who plants a vineyard and does not eat its fruit? What's the answer to that? Does a farmer not get to enjoy the stuff that he's farmed? Of course he does. Then he says, Or who shepherds the flock and does not drink from the milk of the flock? Every shepherd would be able to take from from what he's been working at. And so Paul and Barnabas, are. here's what he's saying. We could refrain from working as some of these other people do, but we're going to see that Paul's saying we've chosen not to do that. Matter of fact, here's what we know about Paul. According to Acts chapter 18, you can read where Paul in Corinth 
You know what he does? He makes what? He makes tents. It's a very intense job. And he is, uh, he's doing his thing, right? He's making tents. We're going to see why this is really significant in a second and, and why, why it matters. Look what he goes on to say, verse 8. He says, am I saying this from a human perspective? Doesn't also the law say the same thing? Now he's pointing back to the Old Testament law. For it is written in the law of Moses, do not muzzle an ox while it treads out grain. What's Paul doing? Well, he's mentioning the reality that God says, hey, when you've got an animal that's working for you, you pay the animal that's working for you by, by feeding it. Make sense? You don't say you work for me and I'm not feeding you. You, you pay for it. And what Paul then does is now he, he implies something else. And he said, there's a bigger principle at work. And the bigger principles we're about to see is if God wants animals to be taken care of when they work hard for you, how much more so does God want his people to be taken care of when they work for you in the gospel's sake? And here's what he says. Is God really concerned about oxen? Isn't he really saying it for our sake? Apostles, for example. Yes, it is written for our sake because he who plows ought to plow in hope. Here we go. And he who threshes should thresh in the hope of what? Sharing the crop. In other words, if we're out here farming and we're working the farm, we ought to be able to receive from what comes out of the farm. And this is what, this is what Paul is, is getting at. Now, with that said, this is massive. Look what he says here, verse 11. If we have sown spiritual things for you, is it too much that we reap material benefits from you? Here's what he's asking. If we've taken this time to invest and impact your life spiritually, is it too much to ask that you provide for our physical needs? like a place to stay and food to eat and clothes on our back and take care of us financially. Look what he he goes on to say. He says, and if others have this right to receive benefits from you, don't we even more? He's saying like others, like not apostles, make this claim too. Nevertheless, he says, we have not made use of this right. Instead, we endure everything so that we will not hinder the gospel of Christ. Do you see what's happening? Do you see what Paul's saying? He's saying, look, I could make use of eating whatever I want, drinking whatever I want. If, if I had a wife, yeah, I, could, I should be able to bring her, and you ought to be able to provide for our needs. And he's going, look, I've laid all that down, and I haven't asked for any of that. Incredible. Look what he says. Don't you know that those who perform the temple services eat the food from the temple, and those who serve at the altar share in the offerings of the altar in the same way? The Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should earn their living by the gospel. What he's pointing to, he's pointing to the Old Testament teaching. In the Old Testament teaching, you would have the priest that would serve at the temple. When they would take your sacrifice and offer your sacrifice, many times it would be divided three ways. One, part of your sacrifice would be burnt to God, and the other part would be barbecued and given back to the people so they could celebrate, and the other part would be given to the guests who? To the priests. It would provide for the priests who work at the temple. Now, Paul's in Corinth, so there's some Jews that understand this, but there are some pagans who would also understand in their temple situation in Corinth that those who serve at the temple of Athena and Apollo and other temples, they also receive their wages because of the work that they did at the temple. Does that make sense? Are you with me? And this is what Paul's getting at. And then he, he notes this. Watch this. He says, and the Lord has commanded. Who is the Lord when Paul mentions the Lord? Who is that? Who is that person's name? Who is it? It's Jesus. He's saying, don't you realize, Corinthians, that Jesus, the Lord, has commanded that those who preach the gospel should earn their living by what? The gospel. In other words, Paul's saying they shouldn't have to work and do something else. Paul's not against working and doing something else. We'll see that in a second. He's already talked about this. He's just saying it's right that if they work for you and that if they, if they invest their time and their energy and their effort that you provide for them. Now, let me tell you what I'm not doing today. I'm not plucking something out of Scripture to go, y'all need to pay me more. <laughs> Number one, I'm grateful that you pay me. I can't believe, there are some times that I go, I can't believe I get paid to, to do what I do. Thank you. I'm saying thank you for providing fellowship for people on our staff. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You've done well. I'm grateful for that. Mormon missionaries I was talking with one day in, in town, and they brought up kind of the big wig, one of the older guys who kind of knew his stuff. And when that guy found out I was a pastor, instead of dealing with the issues that I was bringing up to him, you know what he was going to make a real point of? Jackie, you, they pay you to do what you do. That ought not to happen. So guess what I told him? I said, well, you need to read what Paul had to say. I'm going to trust what Paul said 2,000 years before you were born. And he says that Jesus says that those who work for the gospel ought to be provided through the gospel work. Does that make sense? 
So what we're not doing, if you're new to fellowship, by the way, is we're not picking and choosing and plucking stuff out of Scripture. We're in 1 Corinthians 9. So we come to stuff, and we deal with it. I am grateful for your provision. Don't hear anything different than that. I just, I got to deal with the text, right? Look at 15. Look at this. For my part, I have used none of these rights. Here's what Paul says. Nor have I written these things that they may be applied in my case. He's saying, I'm not trying to make you feel bad so that now you provide for me. He says, for it would be better for me to die than for anyone to deprive me of my boast. For if I preach the gospel, I have no reason to boast because I am compelled to preach and woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. Here's what Paul says. I'm not preaching the gospel because you pay me. I'm preaching the gospel because Jesus has changed my life. I'm preaching the good news of Jesus because I actually believe and live the good news of Jesus, and you don't have to pay me squat because I'm here to share Jesus with you is what Paul's getting at. Look what he says here in verse 17. For if I do this willingly, I have a reward, but if unwillingly, I am entrusted with a commission. What then is my reward? Here's what he says. To preach the gospel and offer it free of charge and not make use of my rights in the gospel. Why did Paul not make use of his rights? Could he? Absolutely. Could others? Absolutely. Are you right to to provide for people on your staff at church? Yes. Why did Paul not do this? Here's why. Here's why. A couple of reasons. Number one, did you know this? My wife and I were talking this week, and and she wasn't aware of this. I'm like, Tanya knows a lot of stuff. If she doesn't know, maybe you don't know it. But uh, maybe I haven't done a good job of communicating this. But did you know this? Did you know that Pharisees, which Paul had been a Pharisee, Pharisees and Sadducees, two different two different groups of Jews, right, that had some differing beliefs and, and, and ideas. But the Pharisees were kind of blue-collar workers. Did you know that? What I mean by that is they didn't, just, they didn't just study and they didn't just teach. They studied and they taught, and they were trained for a trade. Did you know that? They were trained for a trade, and many of them worked on a regular basis in another trade. What was Paul's trade? He was a tent maker. Paul had been, been doing tent making for a long time. Paul said, hey, I can take care of myself. And, by the way, this is cool, beyond, beyond the reality that he was taught to, to work with his hands and perform a trade, the other thing that I'm certain that Paul did not want to do is he didn't want to be indebted to anybody in Corinth. For example, what if Paul shows up in Corinth, there's nothing he can do to make any money, and he goes searching out, and the people that want to bring him in, they might not even necessarily be Christians yet, but they have a lot of money, they have some political sway, they bring Paul in, they provide for him financially. Well, guess what? When they have a a moment that they want to make a political move, guess who they might say, hey, you need to help us make this political move because you've been living in our house, we've been providing for you, Paul. And Paul's like, that ain't happening. So Paul's working on his own with Achilla and Priscilla, who are both followers of Jesus. They're all after the same thing, and they work together, and they live together, and he is not going to be indebted to anybody else to where they can put their thumb over him and say, we're going to tell you what to do. You know what's really cool, though? Here's what's really cool. Did you know that while Paul was in Corinth and other places like this, the church in the place he was at didn't provide for his his needs? He said, I don't want you all to do that, but he allowed churches in other places to provide for his needs. Isn't that interesting? Sort of like what we would do for a missionary, right? We provide for missionaries somewhere else to say, hey, we believe in the gospel message, believe in what you're doing. We want to help you, Tiger Renee Smith, for example. We want to help you, Tessa, and we want to help see how that works. Isn't that cool, how that works? So Paul, it's not like believers never helped Paul. They did, but he made sure that when he was in a city, he's like, I don't want it from you guys. God will provide through other means, including him doing it himself. Look at verse 19. And although I am free from all, and not anyone's slave. This is huge. Watch this. Here's the big point that we're dealing with today. I have made myself a what? A slave to who? To everyone. Now watch this. Why would Paul do this? In order to win more people. In order to win more people. Paul was free. He didn't have to... He didn't have to set down some of his preferences to to go communicate with others, but he's like, I want to. Did you know, by the way, there's a a reference to this in the Old Testament um, from a a kind of a a side uh, side note. In the Old Testament, I I had a friend, Tony and I had a friend in college, and this friend, man, he was super conservative. I don't mean like like us just believe in the Scripture conservative. I mean like conservative, like you're supposed to dress a certain way conservative. You can only use one... 
Uh, one translation of Scripture, conservative, super conservative, right? And so I remember as guys back in my day, the big thing was to get an earring, and I, I just refused to do it because I'm not going to do stuff other people do because they want to do it. But other people getting earrings, and this guy was totally against it, totally against it. And one day that joker shows up with, guess what? An earring. I'm like, Daryl, what is going on? And guess what Daryl had to back him up real, real quick? He says, well, Jackie, Exodus says, and he begins to tell me this. Here's the story. This is the real. This is the truth. The truth. If you were a Jewish person and you had a debt, you could, you could put yourself in slavery, if you will, be employed under somebody, another Jew, and you would have to pay that debt off to them. That's how it works. If you paid that debt off, you're free. If you didn't pay that debt off, the law said that at the seventh year, they had to release you from your debt. At the end of the seventh year, so says Exodus, if there was somebody who had been a slave to another Jewish person, had been an employee, employee essentially, as they're working this indebtedness off, you know what they could do? They could say, you know what, I know that I'm free to leave, but I don't want to. And so what they would do is they would ask for if they could stay, and if they're, the, the person over them, the employer, said you could stay, they would take them to a, a doorpost, and they would take an awl, and they would pierce their ear. That was, that was communicating to everybody as they wore an earring that I belong to that person, not because I have to, but because I want to. So my friend Daryl, he's like, and so there you go. And I'm like, dude, you just want an earring. That's all you wanted? You just want an earring and you found a Bible verse and now you're saying, I belong to Jesus. I belong to Jesus too and I don't need an earring is what I told him. So anyway, nothing wrong with having an earring necessarily, but that, that was the deal. And, and so here's what I'm getting at. Watch, this is exactly what Paul's getting at is this idea is, listen, I'm free. But he says, I'm not a slave to anybody. But then he says, you know what I've done? I've willingly made myself a slave in order to do what? To win more people. And what he means by that is to share the gospel with more, to see more people come to Jesus. And then he begins to give three examples of, of the way that he has put himself in this bond, is this slavery, and, and take basically he's walked away from some of his freedoms, right? He's, he's pushed some of his preferences and freedoms to the back burner so that on the front burner he can put the message of the gospel to people who don't know Jesus. In the first group he says, and to the Jews, I became like a Jew to win Jews, and to those under the law, again Jews, like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law to win those under the law. That's a little bit wordy, but let me ask you a question. We already said that Paul was a Pharisee, right? And a Pharisee is a Jew. So here's my question. Why, if Paul is a Jew, does he need to make himself like a Jew? It's weird, isn't it? You know why? Because Paul is a Pharisee. When he came to put his trust in Jesus, he saw that he had freedoms, that he was no, no, no longer bound, for example, to sacrifice animals because Jesus is the ultimate what? Sacrifice. So he realized that Old Testament, that was great stuff, and it led us to Jesus, right? But I'm not going back into that and sacrifice animals because Jesus is the perfect sacrifice, correct? Let me ask you a question. Paul called himself an apostle to the, to the nations or to the Gentiles. Isn't this true? So he would go and he would share with Jews first, but then he would always go to Gentiles. And he believed that Jesus called him specifically to go impact Gentiles. Let me ask you a question. When Paul was around Gentiles, do you think he dressed like a Jew? When Paul was around Gentiles, do you think he ate like a Jew? When Paul was around Gentiles, did he say, look, I can't have any of that pork because y'all have pork and I can't. Did he do that? No, because he understands that all things are clean in Christ in the new covenant. And he understands that he has freedom to eat and drink what he wants to eat and drink. Does this make sense? But this is so wild. Watch this. You know what Paul does? When Paul gets around other Jews, he understands that the gospel message itself is offensive, and he's not going to draw any more offense than what the gospel gives. Let me give you an example. If Paul showed up among Jews, and they're eating together, and Paul's like, I'd really like to have some pork. What would the Jews think? No, you shouldn't do that. When other things are going on in the culture, you know what Paul would do is Paul would say, hey, I'm willing to follow that tradition in order to share the gospel with people. And he's not disobeying Jesus and doing any of these things. He's not going to disobey the Lord in doing these things, but he's willing to, to move forward and, and move his preferences and, and what the freedoms he has in Christ to the back burner so that he can reach these folks. So when he's around Jews, he dresses like a Jew. He eats like a Jew. Do you know in Acts we see in Acts chapter 21 that there are Jews in Jerusalem, the place where Jesus has been killed, has been crucified, has risen from the dead, 
It's a place where the church began to explode and make an impact right there in Jerusalem. When Paul goes back, there are Jews in Jerusalem that have heard is Paul is not a good Jew. He doesn't teach the scriptures. He doesn't believe in the law of Moses, which are false, okay? But in order to make them understand that I'm, I'm serious business about God and who he is and what he says, you know what Paul did? Paul took on a Nazarite vow, which means that he cut his hair, allowed his hair to start to grow, grow long until he fulfilled his vow. He also paid for a sacrifice to take place on his behalf, and he washed himself ceremonially, all things that are mentioned in the Old Covenant. Why did he do that? Because he had to? No, he's free. Why did he do that? Because he was trying to reach you in Jerusalem, Jews. Do you see the picture? Jackie, what's your, what's your point? Well, there are people who are offended by the message of Jesus. And as followers of Jesus, we don't need to be more offensive just because of, of preferences that we have and freedoms that we have. I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example in our life. There are people in our culture who might not dress like we dress. They might not listen to the music that we listen to. They, they might not look like we look like. And you know what we could do? We could have this attitude is when you start dressing like I dress and look like I look and go to the places I go, then I'll make some time for you. But what do missionaries do, y'all? Is that what they do? Do they go to China and go, all you Chinese people, you need to learn English? Is that what they do? No. Does, when Tessa goes to Haiti, does she say, y'all need to stop speaking Creole, which is a messed up version of French, and you need to, you know, you need to learn English? Is that what she does? No. And you know what Tessa does when she goes there? You guess how she dresses? Sort of like they dress. You see, the principle here is this idea of saying, let's communicate in a way that makes sense to the culture. Listen, we never, ever, ever dilute the message of Jesus, but we're willing to change our preferences, and we're willing to, we're willing to change the way we communicate it so we can communicate the message of Jesus with more clarity, right? And the message of Jesus is offensive. Here's what it is. Ready? You and I are created in the image of God, but we have marred the image of God because we've sinned against God. That's offensive. And the only way you can be made right with God is that you turn from your sin, offensive word in our culture, right? You turn from your sin, and you turn to the Lord Jesus, and you trust him with your life, and he will forgive you and cleanse you, right? Isn't this the message of Jesus? Here's what I know about you. You don't like to be told that you're wrong. Isn't that true? Matter of fact, just turn to somebody and say, you're wrong. It just feels good to tell somebody, you're wrong, you're wrong. But, but, but it feels good to tell somebody else, but you don't like somebody else what? To tell you. And here's the point. Here's the point. The gospel message communicates something. Yes, you're made in the image of God, but you have sinned. You are what? You're wrong. That's the message of the gospel. And so when we bring this message, the message itself is offensive because it's true. And what Paul says, I don't want to cause any more undue offense. I want to reach people with communicating a a way that makes sense. Look what he goes on to say. He says this. He says, to those who are without the law, who is that? Gentiles, right? To those who are without the law, like one without the law. Though I am not without God's law, but under the law of Christ. To win those without the law, to the weak, I became weak in order to win the weak. Again, when he gets around Gentiles, he's acting like a... Gentile. Now, he's not practicing their religion. He's not praying to their gods and all that junk. He's not going to disobey Jesus, right? But what he's doing is he's dressing like them. He's eating like them. He's rubbing shoulders with them. By the way, this is so cool. This whole tent making thing, we're fixing to see in just a second a video clip I've got for you. Did you know that that the major Olympic games happened every four years? The Isthmian games happened every two years, and, and they would move from Corinth into the area of Isthmia, where that Isthmus is we've talked about. And when they did that, guess they would stay in. Guess what kind of facilities they would stay in while they're there for the games? Tents. Who makes tents? Who fixes tents? Paul. Do you see how even what he does allows him to rub shoulders with the Gentiles in this way? What about to the weak? Well, certainly in context to the weak, first, I I would say this is applied to those who are believers, who are immature, who are strong. Struggling, like, hey, you eat that meat to the God of this other temple, and Paul would go, then I'm not going to eat the meat. Is it causing you offense? I'll teach you more. I'm not going to eat the meat. Here's the other thing, though, to the weak. Could, could be referring to those who are intellectually not as astute as Paul, and that would probably be like every one of us because Paul's way up there. But you know what I love that Paul did? Watch this. He put the cookies on the bottom shelf. He communicated the gospel message in a way that made sense to people. 
didn't he? And when he's with Jews, he spoke like a Jew. And when he's Gentile with Gentiles, he spoke like a Gentile. And look what he says here in verse 22. I have become all things to all people that I might by every possible means save some. Now I do this because of the gospel so that I may share in its blessings. Does that sound like a lot of work to you? It does, doesn't it? Like, okay, depending on who I'm around, my strategies are a little different. My tactics are a little different, right? Why would, why would Paul go through all that effort? And why, I would submit, why should we go through that kind of effort? Get this, because people matter to God. Because the gospel message is what? Just for white Americans, is that right? No, it's for all people of all nations. Isn't that right? And we're called to take this message to other people as well. What are, the, what are the blessings? What are the blessings of the gospel? Well, I think one of the blessings of the gospel is certainly this, that we get to see other people know Jesus on this side of eternity, and when they pass, we know they're with him on the other side of eternity. Matter of fact, here's what I'd, here's what I'd say. It doesn't matter what you own. It doesn't matter how many trophies you have how prestigious you are on this side of eternity. Listen to me. When you breathe your last, you're not going to give a rip about that. You know what you're going to care about? Who is the Lord allowed me to impact? Who's going to be there when I get there? Who's going to be there after I get there? Because God's used me and used you, used other believers to impact their life for eternity. That's the goal. That's the blessing we share in the gospel. You know, the other blessing that we share in the gospel is to hear these words. Do you think when Paul got his head chopped off? Because he did. He got beheaded for the gospel's sake. Do you think when Paul opened his eyes to the other side and he saw the Lord Jesus, do you think he heard something like this? Paul, you didn't do much for me, dude. Do you think that's what Paul heard? Do you think Paul heard... Uh, not very proud of you. You think he heard that? No, you, think, you know what? I think he heard something like this, Paul. Well done. You've been a good and you've been a faithful servant. Well, let's be real for a second. The older you get, I think the reality, at least for me, I think it'll be true for you. The, the older you get, there will be moments you start to think about the reality of your mortality. And, and you're going to think, you know, There is a day that I'm actually going to breathe my last. And and quite frankly, and I think this is true of you too, in that moment, I'm not going to care what you think about me. Because you're not going to be on the other side to tell me what you think about me. When you get to the other side, we're going to be one in Christ. But I'm interested in the one who's going to say to me, either well done, you weren't ashamed of me in my gospel, or I never knew you. How about you? Let me show you this video clip. I think it will help hit the point home, and we'll finish up with a couple more passages. So give you some insight into Corinth. Watch this. Now remember, the isthmus is a land bridge, and Corinth is found at the four-mile-wide land bridge that connects mainland Greece with the southern Peloponnese Peninsula. And this isthmus is right where Corinth was. And on the east side of the isthmus, is the town of Isthmia, and that's where I am now. In the Greek world, the most prominent athletic event was the Olympic Games. The second most prominent event is the Isthmian Games, and that's where we are now. The Isthmian Games took place every other year. Now, excavations have found a stadium, a sanctuary, a theater, and even a hippodrome. I'm sitting at the starting gate, This is where the races would take place at the stadium. It's actually the only remains of the stadium. This stadium was before Paul's day, actually, about five and a half centuries before Paul was here. This hole in which my feet were, this is where the starter would stand. And there would be wires that would run down each of these lines. The wires would be under these loops and it would be attached to the starting gate and a piece of wood. And at the right moment, at the start of the race, the starter would pull on all the wires, the wood would drop, and that would begin the race. 
Now every athlete in the Isthmian Games took an oath, an oath that they would abide by the rules of the games, and if they didn't, they would be disqualified. Paul refers to that in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. The events that happened at the Isthmian Games include things like running of races, included wrestling, boxing, throwing of the discus, throwing of the javelin, the long jump, chariot races, and other events. Now this is not the stadium where Paul would watch the Isthmian Games. That's over the hill, but it's currently being excavated. Not far from here is another stadium from Paul's day that we can see what those stadiums looked like during the time of the Isthmian Games. Now what's interesting about being here in Isthmia when it comes to the story of Paul in 1 Corinthians is that Paul by trade was a tent maker. And in the region of Isthmia there was not permanent housing, which means every other year when the Isthmian Games took place, all the athletes needed accommodations. All of the spectators needed accommodations. All of the representatives from the Greek states that came to watch their athletes participate in the games needed accommodations. And where would they stay? intense. So certainly when Paul was here in the summer of 51 AD during the Isthmian Games, he not only stayed in a tent, but he would have worked here to make and repair tents for the participants and for the spectators and the official representatives for the Isthmian Games. Certainly not far from here, Paul would have sat and watched the Isthmian Games take place. Pretty cool background, huh? But listen to what Paul says, and you see the significance of, of what he writes here. When he says, don't you know that the runners in the stadium all race, but only one receives what? The prize. You think the Corinthians would have understood that with the Isthmian Games right down the road? Then he says this, run in such a way to win the prize. Now, everyone who competes exercises self-control in everything. They do it to receive a perishable crown but we an imperishable crown. Again, every two years, and they were training for 10 months. Before they came, they, were, they had to be training for 10 months. And when they showed up in Corinth for that last month, they would train in the gymnasiums and on the, on the fields, and they would train together for a month to make sure that the competitors who were going into it were ready for the competition that was happening there. They, they restricted their diet. They made sure that they went to sleep on time, Right? They worked out really hard, sweat to exhaustion. Did they do that to lose? No. Why would they compete like that? Because their goal is to what? Is to win in whatever they were competing in. And this is exactly what Paul says. He says they win, they win a prize. And then he mentions it's a perishable prize. It's a perishable prize. You see, when they won, they would win a crown. These are a couple of reconstructions of the crown. It had leaves. One was a, a pine. We understand pine. And then another, at one point in, in Paul's day, they used kind of a celery that was rolled up. Well, what would happen after a little bit of, of that being around their head? You, you think they wear it around their head for the rest of their life? No, because that's going to rot, isn't it? Because it's something that is perishable. It's something that's perishable. And so what Paul is doing, you see, listen, you see even what he's writing, he's communicating to the Corinthian culture in language they understand, right? To the Gentiles, I'm speaking in like a... Gentile to a Corinthian, I'm speaking to a like a Corinthian. Imperishable. What about the imperishable? Look at the next one. And run in such a way to win the prize. And he says, they do it to receive a perishable crown, but we, what kind of crown? An imperishable crown. One that's going to last. By the way, there is no reference in the scripture that Jesus is going to put a golden crown on our head. I don't give a rip about some kind of rock that we view as valuable sitting on my head when I'm standing before the king of kings who died to pay for my sin. I don't care what's on my head. I don't care if I'm bald. I don't care if I'm whatever. You, you with me? What I care is the one standing right in front of me because he is our prize. When Paul uses the language of, a, of an imperishable crown throughout his writings, he's referring to the prize, get this, of eternal life through Jesus. That's what, that's what will not perish for us. So while your 401ks go down the drain or while you're, uh, as, as you get older, you know what I'm learning is I'm not going to be in great shape all of my life. It's getting harder and harder and harder. 
and one day I'm just not going to be in very good physical shape, and that's okay because all that is perishable. Well, you know what's imperishable? Is standing before my king one day. And knowing that I have eternal life in him, even now that you and I can know that. And so look what he says. He closes with these words. So do not run like one who runs aimlessly. Can you imagine somebody just taking off in a race and they're not following the, the lines that they need to run down, right? They, they take off a different direction. Their arms are flailing rather than the way that they need to be. He says, I don't box like one beating the air. He's like, no, I got a target attached to this, right? Instead, I discipline my body and I bring it under strict control so that after preaching to others, I myself will not be disqualified. See the language that's being used and how people in Corinth would understand? In other words, watch this. Paul is not just going through the motions, y'all. He wants to say, you know what? I want my walk to match my talk. When I'm telling others about Jesus and turning from their sin and trusting him and following him that he's faithful through it all, I don't want to just talk about that. I need to walk that out in my own life. I don't want to tell others, and they stand before the Lord, and he says, well done. And I stand before the Lord, and he's like, you talked a great game, but you didn't believe it. You didn't live like you believed it, right? He said, I don't want to be disqualified. I trust Jesus, and I follow Jesus. And here's what Paul's saying. Listen, Christian, if you're a follower of Jesus, how disciplined are you in following Jesus compared to the discipline that you put into the physical training, the prestige, the trophies, the paycheck, the position, right? How much time and effort and sweat have we put into saying, Jesus, I want to follow you with my whole life? And here's the challenge I want to give you as we're finishing up. I want to challenge you to ask or answer these questions in your own life. Are you and I, are we making time? to open the Scriptures, to know who God is and what He said? And are we making the time to pray to the one true God? You know, some of us spend a whole lot more time watching the news than we spend opening the Scripture. A lot of us spend a whole lot more time on social media than we do opening the Scripture. Isn't that true? And if you were to look at that and say, what do I care more based on the amount of time, where where would it look like we care more, the news and social media? which, by the way, is perishing. But do we want to know the God of Scripture? you got to get in the what? Scripture. How about prayer? One of, our, one of our ladies who has been a faithful follower of Jesus in fellowship the whole time I've been here, she said this to me afterwards. She's like, Jackie, before we even started today, she came up to me and she said, Jackie, I've been praying for you more this week. I'm like, thank you, sister. Give me all you got, right? But, but she said, I've realized that I'm not praying like I need to. I really need to get back in the, in the habit and discipline of prayer. I need to grow in that too. How about you? How about that? How about this? Are you walking in obedience? Right? Because it's one thing to tell others to walk in obedience. What do we have to do? We got to walk in obedience. We don't want other people to make it, you know, it, for the race and get the prize. And, and we're, we're those who have been disqualified. Correct? Are you walking in obedience? The Lord knows. Right? The Lord knows. How about this? You spending time with maturing Christians? If you're online today and you're with us today, thank you for being here. But here's the truth. If you watch us week after week or you watch somebody else week after week and you're not plugged in with Christians in your community, you need to stop watching us and you need to go hang out with some other Christians who follow Jesus because you need other believers. And you know what, Christians? We need other believers, don't we? We need people to encourage us and challenge us and sometimes correct us because they love us and we need to do life together. Isn't that right? I hope you'll plug, in, plug into one of our groups and, and be about that. One of our groups on Wednesday nights, guys groups, ladies group, student ministry, our children's stuff, Sunday mornings. We've got groups at 10 a.m. We've got some other groups meeting off campus. I'd love to talk with you more about that. And the last part is this. Are you taking the good news to others? Matter of fact, let me ask you this question. I don't want you to answer it out loud. I want you to answer it yourself. When's the last time you shared the good news of Jesus with somebody else? When's the last time you shared the good news of Jesus with somebody else? And you know what I think some of us might say, and we, there's some legitimacy to this. We would say, Jackie, I, would, I don't have anybody to share the good news with because all my friends are Christians. Well, that might be true. So what are you going to do about the people who don't know Jesus in our community? Who's going to reach them? When are we going to be willing to, to lay down some of our preferences and some of our freedoms and say, I'm going to go, I'm going to reach some people who maybe look different than me, think different than me, different age, 
different background. Isn't that right? Aren't you grateful, parents? And aren't you grateful if you're a child who grew up like me that you were impacted by some people from a different generation that, that took time and effort to impact your life when you were a little kid? Aren't you grateful for that? I'm grateful for Mr. Sonny. I'm grateful for, for Mr. Bass. I'm grateful for um, some ladies in my life and certainly my parents. When I was little, they're, they're taking time. They didn't show up to their Sunday school class because they came to teach my Sunday school class. Now, you certainly could find a better pastor, a better communicator, a better shepherd than me, but here's what I know. I wouldn't be here today as, as one of your pastors and shepherds. I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for those people getting out of their comfort zone, laying down some of their preferences, their freedoms, and saying, look, I've worked long enough for the gospel. And these, these people in their 60s, 70s, and 80s were impacting my life. Are you? Are you taking the message of Jesus to others? I want to encourage you to do that. And here's what I know. Watch this. If you ask God to use you to share the gospel with others, I'm willing to bet. What's God probably going to do? He's going to give you an opportunity. And you're like, Jackie, I'm not prepared. Then guess what? Get prepared. We would love to help prepare you. Talk with another Christian guy, guys, another Christian lady, ladies, and say, help me get prepared to share Jesus with somebody. Let me finish with this. About 200 years ago, there were two Scottish brothers by the name of John and David, you might know this last name, Livingston. I didn't know who David Livingston was, really, until I, I watched cartoons, right? Bugs Bunny, Dr. Livingston, I presume, right? That's who we're talking about, Dr. Livingston. But do you know about his brother? Do you know about John Livingston? You probably don't. Matter of fact, the Encyclopedia Britannica Here's what it, said, what it says about him. It says that he was the brother of David Livingston. Now, John Livingston was a, a powerful man in his own right because as a young, as a young child, he said, I want, to be, I want to be wealthy, and he was. He made a lot of money, and that's all he was known for. Oh, and being the brother of David Livingston. Why 200 years later do cartoons use and mentioned Dr. Livingston, I presume, David Livingston. Here's why. While his brother dedicated himself to making money, David prayed, and here's the quote of what he prayed according to him. He prayed this. He said, I will place no value on anything I have or possess unless it is in relationship to the kingdom of God. He prayed and he said, God, I want you to use everything I am and everything I have for your kingdom. When he died, Westminster Abbey is where his body is buried. And on it, it says, the inscription says, for 30 years his life was spent as an unwearied, an unwearied effort to evangelize. That is to take the message of Jesus to other people. On his 59th birthday, here's what David Livingston wrote. My Jesus, my King, my life, my all. I, again, dedicate my whole self to Thee. You and I might say, you know what? I, am, I haven't been faithful to take the message to other people. The prize for me has been the trophy, the accolades, the prestige, the money, the fame, the wealth. It's not been the gospel message. I, hey, could we pray something like that today? Whether you're 59 or you're 15, or you're older or you're younger, couldn't we pray and say, Lord, today, I want you to be my source in my life and my strength and my reason and my purpose. And once again, I commit to you, every part of me, to use me for the gospel. Watch this. Not for a perishable crown, but to run a race to win for an imperishable crown and to hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. And I think in that moment we will bow before him. And we will say, without you I can do nothing. You are my life. You are my hope. You are my prize. Let's pray.
Lord, you know every condition of every heart, including mine today. And I pray for those, first of all, who know you and who need to be encouraged today to keep on keeping on, to not be weary in well-doing, but to know that there will be a harvest in time. I pray that you help us keep on trucking, keep following you, keep trusting you. Keep using us, Lord. Get us out of our comfort zone that we'd share the gospel with anybody that we would invest and disciple. Anybody from any ethnicity, any background, any education spot in their life that we would love people. God, I pray for those who claim to know you that are walking in disobedience today. And I pray that they would be wrecked today by the reality of your Holy Spirit confronting them in their sin like you've done to me so many times because you love them and because you care and because you don't want to leave them there. And I pray today would be the day they would say, Jesus, I claim to know you, but I'm not following you like I need to. Please forgive me with your help. I'll follow you the rest of my life. And God, I pray for those who don't know you yet. I pray that you would use what we talked about today and other relationships to stir in them the reality that, that they can be known by you and they can know you as well. And I pray that you would give others the opportunity to speak the truth of Jesus in their lives. And I pray as they seek you, that you would help them to find you. That's what we ask in your mighty name. Amen.